Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Malcolm Maestrell and I'm a membership services coordinator with IWAP. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Leveraging Inclusive Personas to Develop Accessible Design System. Before we begin, we have a few general housekeeping items to go over. Closed captioning is provided. To enable closed captioning, select the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. The stream text links for English, French, German, Spanish, and Swedish will be posted in the chat as well. American Sign Language Interpretation is also provided. Microphones are muted to prevent any background noise or disruptions. Please post your questions in the Q&A. Questions will be saved until the end of the session. The chat will be monitored for general dialogue and technical issues. And today's webinar will be recorded and available in our webinar archives. And we will send out a copy of the recording and presentation to everyone who registered. And now I would like to turn today's program over to our presenters, Mitali Kamat, Sanaya Yudav, and Loyal Trong. Thank you, Malcolm. So let me go ahead and share my screen, my sound. So just making sure that all of you can see the screen. Looks good. All right. So well, hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to sharing our learnings with you about leveraging inclusive personas to develop an accessible design system. So first a little bit about us. Sanya, Loyal and I are all a part of the accessibility and inclusive design team within products and technology at PwC. My name is Mitali Kamat, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm an Indian woman with uh, shoulder length, black hair and tan skin. I work as an accessibility product design manager within the team. And my role focuses on encouraging teams to shift left in their accessibility journey and involve people with disabilities early on in the product development life cycle. Prior to joining PwC, I've been working as an occupational therapist and I've also pursued inclusive design research with blind and partially sighted individuals. I'll hand it off to Loyal and Sonia to introduce themselves. Hi, uh, one quick thing. Uh, you do have a black screen oh. over. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. There we go. So hi everybody, my name is Loyal Trung. I have dark hair and tan skin. I work as a digital accessibility specialist here at PwC, working with teams on accessible design. Prior to PwC, I have worked in higher education, focusing on accessible electronic and informational technologies, as well as clinically as a speech language pathologist, focusing on assistive technologies and alternative communication. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Sonia. I have dark hair that's about down past my shoulders. Um, I also have tan skin and I have on a black tee, which is what I wear on most days. Um, I've been in the Bay Area for about almost 10 years now, where with the 50 mile radius of tech and everything, I got into the world of user experience and leveraging a user centric but purpose driven approach to design. But a few years ago, I got more involved in, you know, ideas like the end of average and books like that, which kind of piqued my interest toward this idea of pushing boundaries of what I designed toward a more universal form of design. So that's when I entered PwC and I've been working with guiding, guiding, enabling and automating the transformation towards more accessible technology and working with teams to sort of shift left. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back to Mitali to kick us off. All right, thank you both. So we'll be starting today with an overview of our work and our goals, um, then getting into defining the problem, the barriers that we've faced with our engagements with product teams, um, followed by learning more about inclusive personas, what is the importance of inclusive personas, and how we use personas to build an accessible design system. We'll then be getting into more of the refinement and iterative feedback and how the job is not done. We'll get into the relevance of building design systems in the bigger picture and its impact on, on the organization. So as you may have noticed, while we were going over our roles within 
accessibility and inclusive design. Loyal, Sonia and I are all focused on encouraging our product teams to shift left and practice continuous accessibility. So the image on the screen right now is a double diamond graphic, which is commonly used in the product development process. It has, um, though it's called the double diamond, it has three diamonds with the third diamond tapering towards the end. It yeah. has the phases of, is my screen not showing? There's it's like only showing about 75%. That's strange. Is this better? There, there it is. There we go. I have no idea how, why that's happening. I'm sorry about that. Um, so it has the phases of discovery strategy and iterative design prototype build, test and release on it. Um, what we mean by shifting left is that we are essentially working with product teams through all of these phases, right? And when we talk about designing, developing and testing within the iterative design prototype build, test and release phase, a lot of the product teams that we work with are using an, a design system. So we'll be getting more into how we directly work to make that component or the design system in itself accessible. So a design system, right, when it is developed well and it has a good set of guidelines, it provides a lot of support to product teams as well as to the organization. But I'm sorry, I feel like there's some error going on with my screen, apologies. First, let's understand what a design system is, right? Within the context of UI and UX, a design system is essentially a set of standards for development and design that reduces the need to recreate the same components over and over again. So design systems focus on a reusable design um, and a code-based library that can be used across products for consistency in visual design, in usability, and in our case, accessibility. So what happens when the components that you're building with aren't accessible? So what we have for you is, is a video um, of a product team that wasn't using an accessible design system. Um, what happened and how did they solve for it? So let's watch and listen to the video. I'm going to play it again. A lot of technical challenges today. <laughs> All part of the process. <laughs> Apologies. You can probably skip the video and just explain the process of that. Yeah, let me see if I can scan it back. Yeah, not working, so sorry about that. So essentially what the process is that Alex is the designer who's working um, as a product designer. Oh, there you go. How does a designer use a design system? And what happens when it's not accessible? This is Alex. She works as a UI designer in our company and is in the process of building wireframes for a product that she's working on. Since it's a client-facing product, she receives instructions from her product manager to use the brand approved design system within the company. After building out her initial wireframes, Alex visits the design system library to pull reusable components such as buttons, drop down menus, and form fields to complete her design. She marks up her designs and hands them off to the developer for build. After the pages have been built, as a part of the review and approval process, they are handed off to the accessibility team for testing. The team completes testing the pages to realize that there are a number of areas within the pages which are not accessible. This information is conveyed to the product team and they are not happy with the amount of effort it's going to take to implement these changes. The team sits together to assess what needs to be done and realizes 
the design system that they're building with does not consider accessibility needs. So using one inaccessible piece, which was reused 50 different locations, caused a higher number of accessibility gaps. In order to incorporate these changes, what if we work on fixing the reusable components in themselves? Won't that put us in a better position to start with? Adding accessibility into these components will not just help us out, but other product teams too. The team decides to get in touch with the accessibility team and come up with a plan to build an accessibility within the component library. All right, so like we learned, you know, what happens when you build with an accessible design system and why is it important? So on the screen right now are images of parts that are required to build a table on the left and the built version of the table on the right. So building in component accessibility with the correct specifications early on allows designers and developers to know that the, each of the parts that they are building with or each of the components that they are building with are in themselves accessible. Although this does not ensure the accessibility within the pages themselves, it still gives designers and developers a head start by considering diverse needs at the component level early on. So let's consider a popular Swedish department store, right? That has a selection of furniture. And in each of the aisles, you'll find stacks of the same furniture packaged neatly for their customers. Within the package are a variety of specifically designed parts with a good set of instructions on how to put it together. And thousands of families that we know use the same furniture in their homes to build uh, a couch, a table, or any other part of furniture. So a very important word for what I just described is scalability. Fast, efficient, and easier to implement at the large level. The goal of building an accessible design system is to give our designers and developers or our customers all the right pieces with the correct instructions so that they're able to build a usable and accessible product. So let's talk more about how we considered a diverse set of needs, right? By looking at inclusive personas. What exactly are personas? Personas are models representing potential stakeholders who may use a product or a service. Although they are fictional people, if they are built well, their characteristics, their needs, their goals, and their motivations are all rooted in insights and feedback that is collected from various sources. For us, our personas have a combination of characteristics. They come from formal, informal interviews and surveys, people with lived experience with disabilities within our team, and past experiences of our team members who have worked in the field of disabilities. They begin as early provisional sketches and often evolve through iterations as more information is gathered. What is important to remember is that personas are behavior models. They do not represent the full demographic of any given population, which is why it's important to keep collecting feedback and to keep iterating. So why should we consider what we call an inclusive persona or a persona spectrum? Considering a wider set of needs allows us to identify the potential barriers that people might face while they're interacting with our products. These don't just include people with disabilities, permanent disabilities, but also allows us to consider situational and temporary disabilities as well. So on the screen are examples of icons of permanent, temporary, and situational disabilities across multiple sensory channels. Considering a persona spectrum leads to an increase in product desirability and functionality for users, as well as an increase in reach and revenue. For example, by considering the needs of a user who's blind, we are also potentially building for someone who's aging and maybe has developed cataract. Or for designing for someone who uses a switch to navigate their interface, you're potentially also building for designing for someone who maybe has an arm injury. Next, I'll hand off to Loyal to dive deeper into building personas. Uh, thanks, Vitaly. So here are points that I'll go over in this section on how to build inclusive personas, specifically physical, sensory, and cognitive considerations, and persona examples and templates. One of the most important questions to ask while building inclusive personas 
is have we considered a range of abilities and how our personas might engage with the environment around them? Let's look at what considerations we can make while building our persona. So sensory considerations. Most interfaces are biased towards the visual and auditory senses. While building inclusive personas, we need to look at if we have considered a spectrum of sensory abilities. Next is physical considerations. Similarly, we need to ask ourselves if we have considered the range of physical abilities and how that impacts optimal engagement. Lastly, cognitive considerations. Have we considered individuals with cognitive challenges? Designing for accessibility needs in this area also provides elements which prevent overstimulation and fatigue for all users. We start with building personas based off of, of a core disability that identified on the WCAG guidelines. WebAIM and disability data based on disabilities and co-occurring conditions. We also use personal experiences from our team members who have disabilities, worked in the disability field, and former clinicians in our team. This helps us fill in the gaps and make a more representative, inclusive, and realistic persona. We then find connections between disability characteristics of these personas and accessibility criteria within WCAG. This creates a real connection and understanding that specific criteria directly affect people with disabilities and the personas we have created. Building a direct connection and understanding of what a specific success criteria does in real life makes the developer or designer understand and empathize with the end user. As we start matching disabilities to the success criteria, we begin to build components to WCAG 2.1 level AA specifications. Here's an example persona. We look to not just create a persona to only focus on the disabilities. We look to create an inclusive persona that includes their interests, what they enjoy doing, their type of career or work, what they identify as, and what their frustrations and pain points may be throughout the day. This way we can identify how their capabilities and daily obstacles translate into our component selection and design. We look at a persona using an iteration of a clinical framework called SET, S-E-T-T, -T, and, and we adapt it to create personas for design systems specifically. S, specifics of the individual's strengths, current skills, and difficulties. E, environments they are in. T, tasks they need to complete within those environments. And T, tools they need or currently use to complete the task. Once that's understood, we are able to apply what we learn to how we build our design system and components. So let's break down how we build a new inclusive persona by analyzing each area of set based on Ivan's information. So inclusive personas should be created with real characteristics based off of interviews, surveys, and experiences with people with disabilities. On this slide, we see a drawing of Ivan sitting in a wheelchair, taking a selfie with a phone on a stand. Ivan lives in London, he takes the train, blogs about cerebral palsy in the workplace, lives close to bars and restaurants. Since he has cerebral palsy and is in a wheelchair, he may have weaknesses in his legs and or arms. Difficulty with precise movements like writing or buttoning up his shirt and difficulty speaking. The image on the slide shows Ivan approaching a front desk person asking for help. Once we know who we are building for, we start to ask the questions like, what characteristics are we designing for? We start to look deeply into the characteristics of a person. So for Ivan, he has a cerebral palsy and he uses a wheelchair. He must understand and acknowledge that not all people with cerebral palsy or any other diagnosis have the same obstacles or characteristics. So Sarah with cerebral palsy may have different needs and obstacles than Ivan with cerebral palsy. There's often a phrase in the disability community, and it goes like this. When you meet one person with autism, 
you've only met one person with autism. It's meant to highlight the differences within the group and characteristics may appear differently even within the same diagnosis. That's why we break it down and look at a range of possibilities and likely characteristics, also acknowledging people with co-occurring disabilities. So based on these considerations, two things come to mind. He mainly uses a keyboard and has a difficult time speaking. For someone who may be typing to communicate with coworkers and uses a keyboard to navigate application, applying keyboard navigation prin principles to our applications is important. Like visible, visible focus indicators that works on light and dark backgrounds, logical tab order, and make sure all elements that can be interacted with are usable by keys and do not require the use of gestures or movements of a mouse. We also want to be aware to provide an alternative input method to any apps that use speech recognition, since he has a difficult time speaking. This also helps people who may have just gone to the dentist and are unable to speak clearly, or people who have a stutter that is not recognizable by speech recognition software. The image we see on the right is of a product that has a search field. The search field has a place to enter text, but also has a microphone icon that allows the user to speak and ask questions into that form field. The, hit, the image here shows someone using a mobile phone at a train station. We also look at what environments do our customers use our product. Why is the environment important? In order to have a more inclusive persona, we need to look at where the user is completing their task. Is the user primary, primarily using the product in an office, or are they a remote and mobile worker who may be using products on a tablet or mobile device when they're commuting on business or just on the way home? We take all these environments into consideration when building and designing at the component level, since different types of assistive technologies may be used based on the type of device. What stands out to me here is that he works at home and in the office. Since he also takes a subway, I'd expect that he may be on his phone or tablet for work at times. Since workstation setups at home and in the office may differ, we want to ensure that our application is robust, meaning that they work with different types of assistive technologies. Although he may not use a mouse at work, Ivan may have an adaptive mouse that he uses at home. Ivan is also on the train and may use a mobile device. This information reminds me that the application must work in landscape and portrait mode. Also be able to be locked in a fixed orientation to his preference. Other things to be aware of is making buttons large enough and, and with sufficient space between each other. For users with involuntary movements like tremors or anyone on a bumpy bus or train trying to send an email to meet a deadline. What tasks does Ivan do? Here we highlight social media apps and user engagement applications. The task is often the goal and the, of the individual and the goal of the product. Within our design system, we review our portfolio of products and examine what type of tasks are being performed in order to create a library of components that would be used in our long list of products. By working with product managers, we examine the types of components that are needed for the individual to perform their specific tasks. Understanding the task directly influences what components are used and how they need to be designed. Even though our products use general and basic components like buttons, links, and search fields that are innately accessible using basic HTML, due to the complex nature of our products, which require a complex ta task to be completed, many components were built from the ground up. This is when inclusive personas play a major role. One second. Later on, we will pair the characteristics of our personas with each component to determine how they interact with one another. Here's an example of those complex components that we work to pair with our personas. Here's one of our components 
where we had to build from the ground up. It's a date range picker that serves a specific business case across several products and used by many people. It has the ability to type in our dates. Another method to pick up your, to pick your date on a calendar and select increments of days, weeks, and months. Based on our persona we created, we were able to create, test, and revise the components to meet our accessibility standards. We also provide specific accessibility guidelines on how it should function, how it should not be used, and alternative ways to use them. This is an image of a review component that consists of large enough form fields, rating scales, and detailed fields with large interactive elements with a focus indicator. The information here shows that Ivan spends the majority of his time on social media and engagement apps focused on the content creation. Given that we currently know about his skills, abilities, and obstacles, we can expect that he needs an application that works on a mobile device, large enough interaction elements for touchscreen users, and designed with keyboard and switch accessibility in mind, since he may have his mobile device mounted on his wheelchair. Our final consideration uh, when building an inclusive persona is tools. What types of tools or assistive technologies are used? When a wide variety of tools and assistive technologies are added to the inclusive personas, it gives the designers and developers the opportunity to create these tools as well and verify and test these components with the same assistive technologies used by our personas. When designers and developers use assistive technologies to test and verify their components, they don't just, uh, they don't just de design and develop for the mythical average person, but for a more diverse population, which in turn creates a more robust experience. Based on this information, I, Ivan uses many different applications on both mobile and desktop devices. He also uses different types of assistive technologies based on the type of devices he is on. So for this, for his specific persona, applications that have keyboard and switch access is very important. We'd expect that he uses some type of switch scanning navigation when on his mobile device for things like Instagram or Facebook and a robust desktop application that works well with keyboard only and switch-based navigation. As we work through the set framework, we end up with a variety of personas. By building these inclusive personas, we are able to align them with WCAG 2.1 level AA standards and continually enhance our components to expand the usability to more needs and characteristics in an iterative process using WCAG as a baseline. From there, we look at other component features that would enhance the use of other types of users with disabilities, such as people who use two-step switch navigation on a computer, interactive elements, behaviors for active, inactive, hover, and tab states, and users of alternative pointing methods. So now I'll switch it to Sonia. Thank you, Loyal. Uh, can everyone hear me good? Yeah. All right. Um, so job isn't done yet, right? Uh, we have the pieces. How do we move forward? When personas are created and implemented into design and development of the design system, the job isn't done. In this section, I'll be talking about the importance of working with stakeholders and tracking feedback for constant refinement of the components and product. So on the screen, we have a list of different types of research methods designers use, um, industry research, user research, ethnography, so on. So for any product team, there's a number of steps taken to ensure product quality with a user-centric approach. At PwC, we stop and test every step of the way, whether it's rapid prototyping in a day or a more thorough user acceptance testing with deep dive synthesizing that takes a couple of weeks. Um, that's something we want to have at the forefront of anything we create. So what does this look like for our design systems? As we are engaging with teams, we 
track teams who are using our design systems, what components they're using. Um, the design and development support teams within the accessibility and inclusive team discuss which teams have certain components used well, which teams fall short, and where we can make changes. These are things we consider every step of the way. For tracking data, we have our accessibility tester review the component to meet RECAG specifications, and then feedback is provided. We identify what the component is, what it's used for, which product it's affecting, so that we can see the scenario it was used in, and then which RECAG criteria it does or does not meet, and then provide recommendations on what obstacles they're facing and how it relates to specific WCAG success criteria. So WCAG success criteria can be subjective. It's, it can be interpreted in different ways. Users may have preferences and use cases on how they interact with components. There's context, which ultimately affects the design system. So let's talk about logical order, for example. Um, it's, it, it's not concrete and maybe subjective, we need user feedback to determine an order that is logical for specific users in a specific use case. A designer may be using components within our system to build either an application or a website. So the, comp the component usage and accessibility should be tied to use case for best practices, right? Like a CMS, for example, where someone is sharing a news story, it's pretty linear. You'd go down the page and you'd read it as you go. So the logical order would follow that same pattern but an app could be more dynamic. You may start at the search bar, you may start at the navigation pattern. Heading structure isn't top-down logical within apps. It really depends on the user story and that's where research comes in. So what steps are we completing first, right? Let's look at Outlook. Everyone at, um, everyone kind of uses a mailing app. Um, sometimes I search my email. Sometimes I may go straight to my calendar. So this is the point where you, you need to take like that initial instruction that we got with the, you know, Ikea pamphlet with all the different pieces and we need to build the table. Is it for work? Is it for dinner? What, what is the context, right? So when tracking user feedback for iterative refinement, we're considering a wider range of challenges. Um, we're considering what assistive technologies are being used and how those technologies are being used. Um, that's where, you know, for example, what Loyal just walked us through with Ivan's story really helps us. This creates, it, it creates a more robust set of experiences that we can pull from that will enhance and refine our design systems and products, building and designing products more accessibly and more inclusively. But it's not a linear path, right? It's, it's a moving target. People and technology, they change over time. That's why we want to focus on continual improvement and not an end. And to achieve this, um, that's why I do want to really stress on, you know, continuous testing. Screen reader users on our team test the system components and make sure they're aligned with the WCAG 2.1 AA, provide us with feedback on usability, accessibility. Once the feedback is provided, our team discusses it as a group to determine whether the component is using correctly or if the issue is at the component level, like how is it how the table was built or is the bolt the issue? Um, once it's decided that the component is inaccessible, we fix it and we add usage guidelines and accessibility guidelines to our design system for each component. But you know, as we're saying, technology changes over time, people's needs change over time. As technology improves, uh, fe feature sets change, how we operate changes. And you know, PwC, we always say we need to adapt. And that's something we really need to embody in how we practice um, approaching these design systems. An example of how this plays out, and this is a small example, but it's it's relevant and it makes a difference. You know, these these small niche parts of user experience. So this is a single input slider developed for a design system. There's a slider on the left hand side, but there's an input field that doesn't have a minimum or maximum value. So on the right, it gives you a start and end value that is read out for the user. So we had a participant that wasn't sure whether the input field had a max value. They needed to know what the range is. It's like asking a group of users, how would you rate this pizza versus saying like on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate this pizza, right? Someone might give you 98 on 100, someone might be five stars, right? Somebody might just give you words. That's not what you're looking for. So just those small things about being specific that might be obvious at first, but you wouldn't have thought about are things that come about as, as a result of trying to figure out how do people actually respond to this. And this is just to demonstrate that as product people, we somehow sometimes miss out on these micro interactions and that 
that improve our users experience and we need to consider this for all users adjust a few lines of code as it goes and those small things make a big difference um, this is just to give you also just the product designer's perspective um, you know prototyping quickly gives us helps us give form to an idea allowing us to learn from it evaluate it against other ideas and improve on it um, as a product designer i do believe we need to take the ta time to harvest the power of design thinking, individual teams, whole organizations. We have to fail early to be able to evaluate our thoughts, our designs, and refine them, and then zero in on the best solution in order to learn from how our ideas interact with the world. So design systems, they enable us to do just that, to focus on the experience and solving tough problems rather than laboring over minor elements of the design you know, we're, we're being enabled to produce at scale and move fast and do things quickly, but also thinking through different elements. Teams can continue to use the same elements over and over, reducing the need to reinvent the wheel. And therefore, um, they can they, they reduce like unintended risk and inconsistencies. And this idea doesn't even begin to tap into the idea with cost related to going back and fixing an element. Um, you know, if, if you go back and fix an element rather than doing it right, that cost is 100% of the cost of that first time. And it's it's a hesitancy we face consistently. It's the biggest hesitancy we face where people are like, what about the budget? What about the, what about the time? By adapting to a design system and designing for accessibility at the very start, we eliminate the need to go back and remediate. Um, changes can be made in one place and reflected throughout a product process. So here's an example of a design system. As a designer, I can review a list of components within a design system based on the specific usage guidelines. And that's the example we gave before, right? Um, even the example with the calendar that Loyal shared, there are usage guidelines that go with that. So I have all that information in one place. It helps me decide which component works best for my specific use case. And then I can go back and focus on, you know, sitting down with somebody and being like, how would you use this? outlook app how would you use this email app or whatever it is and, and i can i can put my energy into that from there i can pull all the components all the information i need for the design the code and i can pass it on to developers and it's shipped and it's ready to go changes can be made in one place and reflected throughout a product process and i also want to tie back to the story that mithali shared right um there was this designer and she was handed a brand and she worked with their design system there might be a specific brand identity where they might not have considered, let's say, color contrast for low vision users, right? There might be some elements that didn't consider accessibility. Let's say I have a button that's using those colors that hasn't considered, um, you know, the, it hasn't considered multiple states and how, how they show to low vision users and have low color contrast. When using the design system, if I realize this is an issue, it takes me one minute to change that button across my entire platform. So it's strong and I recommend it to everybody. Um, next slide, please. So one last thought before we sign off and open up for questions. Successful product experiences, they focus on micro moments of a user's journey as much as they plan for the macro moments. Thinking through individual steps of a user's environment and journey, such as how a form is presented, how it's filled out, how it's submitted um, are crucial to completing the goal of a product, but you can't miss out on, let's say the submitted message. You need to think of all of those things and using a design system helps us think through those and testing it helps us find what we've missed. This is why starting with inclusive persona also helps us like think about how we influence how we look at micro moments or interactions at the component level, building components within a design system to be inclusive, accessible, increase our productivity, increase the productivity of our designers, our developers, while increasing the speed and the quality of the kind of products we create for our customers. And with that, um, I'm going to hand it back to Mithali and thank you all and open us all for questions. Thank you. Sonia, and yeah, we are open for questions. We had a little bit of a bumpy start. I'm sorry about that, but yeah, let's open it up. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. This is Malcolm Maestrell. We have a couple questions in the Q&A. First being, when you say, in quotes, building accessibility in your products, what types 
of accessibility issues are you looking to support? Vision, physical, others? Are there some access issues that are harder to accommodate? Yeah, I, I can answer that if. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So for the first question, uh, when you say building accessibility in your products, what types of accessibility issues are you looking to support? Uh, we look at all the senses except for taste. Uh, maybe in the future, that's going to work out in accessibility, but we, we do follow WCAG guidelines and we look to focus on each of those, whether it's vision, physical, hearing, things like that. Um, the, the harder part when you're saying what's harder to accommodate, I would say would be understanding that disabilities aren't just singular. You know, there are a lot of people with co-occurring disabilities. So for example, um, someone with cerebral palsy, they're gonna have motor disabilities, but they also sometimes have vision disabilities as well. So being able to look at both of those types of characteristics and designing for that can be difficult, especially if you're just focusing on one type of disability. So you gotta look at uh, what types of assistive technology they are using. Are they using a screen reader? And also what type of physical disability do they have? Are they, do they have a full range of the keyboard or are they limited to a, limited to a few buttons only? And we need to really exercise that and use feedback to really understand how our users are using our component. Thank you, this is Malcolm again. Do you expect designers to address ARIA roles in the design specs? Do you expect designers to address ARIA roles in the design spec? So what we generally do is we, we pair out ARIA to specific needs. So uh, if it's a button that has a search icon, we'll tell the designer, we'll prep them on what types of ARIA roles to add to that. But most of it is really for the developers. Thank you, Malcolm. Again, is your design system used for a specific development framework? Do you have reusable components for various development frameworks? Java, Angular, for example? Yeah, our design system, you, uh, we have two different ones. So we have React and Angular. Uh, we are starting to use Figma as well. So those are the, the two so far, React and Angular. And that's what most of our, our products within PwC use. And we have another question in the Q&A. Is there a danger to ignore issues not included in persona disability? Yeah, um, I can take that one. Um, there's, that's sort of why we you know, really want to focus on personas are a great starting point, but it's important to keep iterating. They are ultimately a representation for users. They are not actually considering the whole demographic. So definitely, I think if you're using a persona, it's a great starting point, but it's important to know that that doesn't encapture all of the needs that a user might potentially look for. So important, like we know, accessibility is never 100%. Um, and like Loyal said, you know, if you're interacting with one person who has autism and they have a certain set of needs, you really have captured that set of needs. So it's important to keep collecting feedback, to collect it from a variety of sources, like we said at the beginning, and to keep iterating on it and um, keep incorporating those components in your design system. Thank you. This is Malcolm again. We have a few related questions. Um, how do you resolve designing for opposing needs? For example, designers often make things bigger, bolder, and stand out more for low vision users. However, that kind of interface can negatively affect someone with autism, for example. 
too many things on the page or shouting for their attention. Yeah, so that is a very big question. That question is super important. Uh, designing for opposing needs. I wouldn't say there's a, a resolve. It's more of taking in consideration, building it, and then keep on going through that iterative process to see what tweaks we can do. Um, obviously, there is a lot of different needs out there, and it's it's all about getting to progress over building something that is quote unquote a hundred percent perfect because that's not realistic. But really looking at our users and con continue to make those changes as needed. Also, if I might add to that, right, when you're looking at a different set of needs, this is where the set or the clinical framework really comes into play. But because you're looking at the user, you're looking at the environment they're in, that's their context and the activity that they're doing at that particular time, right? So needs, yes, they may be conflicting, but what is the context and what is the occupation or the activity that they're engaged in? What is the task that they're trying to complete? That is also something that, should be considered when you're incorporating those features in. This is Malcolm again. There's a question in the chat. How do you provide a case for cost benefit when stakeholders don't see the value of accessibility? That's, would you like me to answer that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so when we're, when we're looking into designing these design systems, we do run into those things. And this might be an answer that's not specifically to accessibility, uh, but really building relationships. I think building relationships with stakeholders, having them trust your expertise, that's when you can start bringing in accessibility and getting them to buy, buy in. Um, also showing them uh, a variety of different users and demonstrating to them uh, what types of um, components may not be usable uh, to a specific population. Yeah, and if I can if I can add to that as well, if we looked at um, even user experience design, like maybe 15 years ago, most stakeholders didn't see the value in that, and now most major corporations have running user UX teams. Um, so it's just a matter of like storytelling, and it's a matter of like helping people understand. Um, of course, there is value, but it's how do we communicate it, and how do we continue to just advocate and it's a lot of like evangelism and advocacy as well and i think that's a very important part of the process because right now people haven't seen that aspect of it and of course there's running priorities so just being able to understand this is a step-by-step -step process it's going to be incremental it's going to be easy it's in your control it's not hard but you need to understand it as you go and then how do we make it easy for you that's where teams like us come in This is Malcolm again. There's another question in the Q&A. What's your approach of bringing in or attracting testers with disabilities if they're not already employed with you? And then related to that, how often do you work with um, external stakeholders when you're building out a tech? No, absolutely. I think we... We definitely encourage that with our product teams from the get go, right? Like you said, like usability testing, whether you are in the prototype stage or whether you have a build with a diverse set of users is incredibly important. And we are constantly pushing our product teams to do that in order to mature in their accessibility journeys, right? But along with that, we are also encouraging them to co-design. So when product managers or designers are very much in that ideation or MVP stage, we encourage them to tap into our employee resource groups internally, as well as source externally to get that external perspective of what is the diverse set of needs that needs to be included early on. I hope I answered both questions. Yeah. Malcolm again. There's another question in the chat. Can you recommend tools or tech we can use to test the accessibility of our web content? You're probably going to have it already. Uh, I would always recommend just using your keyboard, using the tab key and the enter key, making sure that you have that focus, making sure that you have that logical order. 
Uh, there is also things like color contrast analyzers that you can use. Um, I, I think the, the most important tool that you should be using and learn how to use, because you really have to learn to use this tool, is a screen reader. Um, that's when you can actually tell what exactly is going on and what type of code that you can implement to fix those. Thank you. This is Malcolm. I'm sorting through Q and A. There's another question there. I'm wondering in what stage does inclusive persona get to use and have its most value? Is component request coming from design system designer proactively building up or reactively collecting feedback from the product slash work stream? Okay, I think I think I understand that question, but uh, we can clarify. But I feel like it's always better when it's proactive, right? And personas are beneficial even to product managers as well as designers. So I would say, you know, at which stage would you get them in? Get them in as as early as possible when you're really in that in the double diamond process. If you're in that discovery or strategy phase, that's where you collect. Uh, you know, your feedback, your interviews, and collect that data to really build a robust and comprehensive persona. So then you can capture those needs in your product requirements, as well as in your initial design systems or any of the libraries that you're using. Thank you. This is Malcolm again. And we have another question in the Q&A. Do you have any reference links for accessible design for complex functionality user interaction? For example, an interface where you have to choose from 15 options with a maximum of five values? Yeah, within our design system, uh, within those slides earlier, there was a, a slide with a calendar and user guidelines. What we do is every single component has user guidelines, how to use it, when to use it, when not to use it. We also provide links to, uh, to different websites so our designers and developers could, could better understand uh, the use of those products. And then we have another question in the Q&A. An app built with accessible design system still relies on development teams using components correctly and assigning correct roles and attributes. How do you ensure this? Yeah, does, it, does anyone want to take this? I feel like this is where like the usage guidelines really come into play, right? And when we are, um, like Sanya went over it, when we are collecting feedback, we are not just looking at the component, we are looking at is it the component? Is it the usage? You know, what went wrong there? So this is where, you know, going back to the product team, really getting more insight into what their thinking process is, what was not clear in the guidelines or that initial set of instructions that we gave them to build their table, right? And we can collect that feedback and incorporate that into our guidelines if it's a usage issue. If it's a component issue, it might be something that takes a little bit longer to fix, but that's still feedback that we're collecting to fix the component. And Loyal, you can jump in if I miss. Yeah, and for for Sonia and I and Mitali, we're on more of the design side. And we do have another, what we call a pod within our group. They are developers, they are user testers, they are accessibility testers. And when they look over our components, they provide us with that feedback on what exactly to change. We have another At question. At the code level. So. Yeah. Oh, sorry. This is Malcolm again. One of the major challenges for our design system team for documentation is that, in quotes, no one reads slash nor have time to read what are some of the best approaches you could recommend to make sure that documentation slash information got delivered most effectively? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, and Sonia, do you want to take this? I feel yeah, like I can take that. Yeah. Um, so 
Is the question specific to when you're handing off to developers? I think that's what it sounds like. Okay. Yeah. So what I like to do is use this program called Zeppelin. And what I'll do is I'll mark it up directly on the design. So it's like, you cannot ignore it. Um, there's ways where you can um, export various versions of your design. So you can export a version that is, here's the design and then export a second version that says, here's a markup of like very specifically the guidelines you need to know for each and every one of these pieces. Also take a bite-sized approach, do it step-by-step. Step. Um, one thing I've learned is that like anybody is going to get overwhelmed if you try to do a lot very quickly, like cognitive load happens a lot with everything that's happening on the internet and COVID and everything. So slow things down, take it step-by-step, step, um, break it down, try to make the information simple. Don't overdo the documentation where you have to, don't use complex words, keep things simple and use language that people can understand and people will respond to that. Um, but really it's trial and error, like anything we've said, right? So if people aren't responding, test that hypothesis, like why aren't you responding? Let's sit down, let's see what parts of this documentation are not working for you. And then let's continue to improve it so that we can get to a point where we're working very cohesively as a team. I hope that yeah. answers the question. Yeah, I think you did. And I feel like just to add on top of that, like what Sonia said, I think it's a case by case support like everyone likes to do handoffs differently and like you said there's a lot of people who don't like that intensive documentation some people might actually prefer it so it it depends on what is the style that you know the designer and the developer are meeting at is it an online handoff is it something that requires just annotation documentation you can then support that or is it something like zeppelin which sanya uses right so I think it depends on what the preference is and to meet them where they're at as far as handoffs are concerned. Malcolm, again, I think we have time for one more question. Initial design, development, and input implementation tend to be done in a relatively controlled fashion. Continuous improvement or bug fixes later in the development cycle tend to be less controlled and more rushed. How do you ensure that best practice is undertaken during this phase of the life cycle? Yeah, um, does anyone else want to take how our pods, our engagement process and pods work together? Or else? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what we do here is that our, our team is the design team. We look at how things look, how things should, could be changed visually. Uh, but also what we do is when we switch it to the development pod, they do provide us with uh, feedback. We, once they load it up into our sheet of feedback, we come together and really walk through each recommendation and each fix and see what is one of the, the more important fixes or lower hanging fruit. And that's when we start putting that into the process. So it's it's well vetted and we don't just throw all of the feedback into a bucket and just go for it. We really decide which ones we should focus on based on our capacity, what our team is doing and our ending goal. So this is more for our specific team. If your team is larger, smaller, if your company uh, runs a little bit differently, it's gonna be different for every company. So yeah. for us, this is how we. And we just to add on top of that, right? I feel like the key here is, I agree. I feel like in, when you're in the discover phase, there is like more control, um, but there is way to sort of work with, you know, the dev teams, the product dev teams on there and support them as well. And the key here is like communication between the design discover phases and the build and release, right? It's an agile process we are working with you know software and products and websites that are you know going to be pushed fast and quick so we need to be able to communicate and not segregate our roles so that this is done in a more efficient way i also want to add a quick thing like i want to emphasize what laurel said about low hanging fruit like the the solution here is it's it's different product management frameworks right so identifying like what the opportunity is and how that goes against different different things you need to actually do at that point and being able to prioritize and saying like what is high value what is a need to have what is a nice to have and how do we how do we 
for this along the way. Like you also need to be very cautious about what does need to be developed and what are the business's priorities at that point. And then make sure you're fitting in along the way in a way that doesn't break the cadence and like worry people. Thank you very much. This is Malcolm again. And I want to thank Natali, Loyal, and Sonia for such a wonderful presentation today. It was great to see so many questions from the audience. I also want to thank Beth for her lovely job interpreting and our captioner, Kelly. Thank you very much. For upcoming IAAP webinars, we have on November 15th, an accessibility checker that should be part of your toolkit. And that is the last webinar in our 2022 digital accessibility series. And then on November 29th in our 2022 EU series, we have ableism and digital accessibility, a French citizen's point of view. Thank you again to everyone for joining us today. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks everyone.